from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Today is Thursday, July 21, 2011. My name is Joe Munier of the Southern Oral History Program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I'm with project videographer John Bishop. We are in Grahamsville, New York at the home of Dr. Emmett and Mrs. Priscilla Bassett to do an oral history interview for the Civil Rights History Project, which is a joint undertaking of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture and the Library of Congress. Dr. And Mrs. Bassett, it's such a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for the welcome and thank you for agreeing to sit down with us. It's really great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me um, let me start with this question. Ms. Bassett, I was curious in, in having done some research and preparation of the interview to, I was interested in the question of how you came to be interested in the civil rights question and progressive politics and causes generally as a young, maybe even adolescent young woman coming up, yeah. Well, I went to a, an elementary school in Plainfield, New Jersey, uh, which was, as we look back now, uh, during the progressive era, uh, Howard Rugg, or Harold Rugg textbooks, and uh, just a generally New Deal enlightened uh, environment. However, I did come from a Republican family, um, and uh, I left the, the uh, public school and went to a private school for the last two years of high school. And at that time, um, during, well, it was 19, um, was it? Well, 1944, I guess, that Franklin Delano Roosevelt died. And one of the, my classmates came in to school and said, my father danced on the dining room table last night. So that was, <laughs> the conflicting atmospheres that I had in my educational experience. And I, I did become interested in, in political issues. I remember going to visit our state senator, or no, our, our federal senator, um, Clifford Case, who was now, he would be anathema to the <laughs> Republican leadership. But uh, at any rate, I did have a certain amount of interest, but I was basically a suburban girl who, whose mother had a very limited appreciation of African American people or culture. My father a little less so, uh, less uh, extreme than my mother who was a southerner by birth or by raising. She was raised in the north, but uh, her mother was a southerner and conveyed ideas to her. Um, so when I went to college, um, my second year, there was no money. It was at the end of World War II, and my father uh, really didn't have a job, so I had to go to work, and I went to work at Life Magazine. I, how I managed that, I, I really, there's nobody left <laughs> to explain to me how that happened, but I, uh, had a job as uh, I would have been a sophomore in college had I been there. Um, I was an office girl and I filled the water jugs and sharpened pencils and ran errands and carried copy and you know stuff like that. And I met a very articulate and convincing union uh, member and that opened my eyes to quite a few things. So when I returned the next year to Smith um, it was a period of a lot of activity, and I became involved with the Progressive Party. And for just a second. We're back. We're back after a short break. Mrs. Bassett, you were saying about your, you became interested in, and began uh, in, involved with the Progressive Party. Yes, and of course, uh, one of their uh, major uh, concern was uh, the state of affairs and relationships and and the legal systems uh, in the South. And, and I also was a history major, and of course, because I was a history major, I pursued uh, a certain amount of, of uh, studies. There wasn't 
really. There wasn't any separate um, black history or African American history or anything in those days. Um, but I managed to find my way to learning. Oh, and I remember I remember I had this wonderful book. I forgot that. Uh, it was called The Democratic Spirit, and it was a collection of all kinds of writers. Uh, and um, it, I, have a, I have a copy now. I managed to find one again. And in it was a poem of County Cullen, and that really stuck with me all my life. Um, Dr. Bassett, you um, grew up near the Virginia-North Carolina border. Yes, it's about 20 miles, 16 miles, I think. Yeah, Henry County. Yeah. And um, I think you lost your father when you were a teenager. I was, he died in 1935, yeah. so I would have been about 14 years yeah. old when he died. Yeah. Um, but even by that time, it seems that your, um, what, but what would become your lifelong path of commitment to the cause of racial equality and, and progressive change was was you, you'd even been active by that point as I th as I think I know say in the effort around the Scottsboro trial yes yeah can you describe kind of the the, the nature of life I in your family and on your farm and how you got drawn towards that participation well I can remember before my father died in my first year in high school he had told me. I had some half-brothers, two half-brothers, and they were 10, 12 years older than I was. And they had, my mother had tried very hard to send them to college. And the older son, she had sent to Hampton Institute because she had heard that was a great school. But my brother, O, Obidai, I guess his, na his name was, he didn't do well there at all. In fact, she took $500 out of her $1,000 ins insurance that she had insured herself for when her first husband died. She wanted to leave something for those seven kids she had. And that's what she had done, and she had done that with the Metropolitan Life. Now, I sat around the house and I listened to what everybody said. We had no TV and at that time probably no radio. That came later. So I listened to what my mother said, that it was good to take half of her money and send him to college. But he did very poorly at Hampton. And uh, so the next year she sent him to St. Paul and that was in Lawrenceville, Virginia. And the reason why she sent him there, he could uh, take some easier course, and if nothing else, he could study to be a carpenter. And a few years later, my other half-brother, Matthew, he went to St. Paul. I think he finished high school there and did reasonably well. But he came home and he told me that he thought I should go to Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. And I asked him why did he think I sh should go there. He said, you're a very smart person and your aunt in Cleveland thinks you should come there and go to school. And my, I had two sisters in Cleveland, and they also told me that they would be willing to get me in high school there. I was dubious of that because the schools, elementary school I had gone to, I had probably two teachers out of the seven or eight years I was there that finished the year. They usually dropped out, went other places, and left us without a teacher except somebody who substituted. Right. But I um, remember, uh, I, I kind of remember that you got involved with doing 
uh, civil rights work with the Scottsboro case. Yeah, well. well. How did that fit in? Well, I was just talking about a little bit in Henry County be when my, before my father died. That's what I'm telling you about now. Oh. And uh, my father had told me already that he thought I was the only one that could run the farm out of the whole family. He said, you probably the only one can do it. Now, I had grown up uh, working with my mother in the garden, working with my father in his garden, and I used to hear them arguing about who's going to take him. <laughs> I had another brother, two, about a year and a half older than me. Uh, he didn't like farming at all. He liked no parts of it and didn't want any parts of it. And I had a younger brother who usually stayed home with my, his name was Milton. And he it w was a very good student in school too. So it, I think before my father died, he brought his cousin up. Her name was Ida Dotson. And she had gone to school in the, at Chestnut Knob, which is a little bit south of us, towards Ridgeway, Chestnut Knob. And at Chestnut Knob, they had some teacher, I try to think of his name, but I think it was Holmes or something like that. He came there as principal from Pennsylvania. And he was a teacher my father had gone to, and this teacher, Ida Dodson, had gone to him too. So she felt I was a very smart student, and she tr transferred me from fifth grade, I believe, to seventh grade. And it became a very hostile school for me because I had boys 14 and 15 and 16 and some up as much as 17, 18. And they didn't like me being in their class and they were very hostile. But I guess that's the only place I felt like I had to take a gun to school to protect myself. Was it your father's example, that, or, or your mother too, that inspired your willingness to you know, step forward to contribute in, in civil rights cases and causes? Yeah, my mother thought it was a good idea that we shouldn't just accept things coming from people. And we ran into a lot of problems right there at home sure. because there was white families that had married, see when they got the field their cotton mill companies and they got the Bassett Furniture Company, you had white people moving from Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and maybe Tennessee, a few from Tennessee. And the Bassets, the white Bassets, and uh, my grandfather was given to the Bassett's father when he married a daughter. He married a daughter of the Staples, who, no, no Turner's, I got the wrong name, Turner. That, that was who my grandfather was raised by, and he was a Turner. But he stayed with the Bassett. They didn't put him out in a little house of his own like he lived in at the Turner's. They put him in with their two boys, or maybe three. I'm not sure, but it was two at least. And he slept with them, and he didn't go to schools that they went to. He didn't go to any school at all, right. because at that time, there were no schools for blacks. But these two brothers, so I understand, I got this from them and from my father. They used to come home and teach him math and teach him whatever history that they had learned about in school. So my grandfather picked that up, and according to 
what some of those families told me to Bassett, that he knew more math, more history, than his two sons did. So they made him the boss of the one sawmill, or what maybe it was two, I'm not sure. But these sawmills sawed lumber and they shipped it to Grand Rapids, Michigan. They shipped logs there for a while and later on they started the shipping the timbers there that they saw. Now William Henry was in charge of all of this and he was in charge of a lot of white people. Now it turns out, and this had leaked all the way through to me as a kid, that that uh, the, the Bassets were going to get six million dollars from the Continental Bank of Chicago to build a furniture tube factory. Yeah. But the, he had to get the approval of the state of Virginia. Okay. Now the state of Virginia, say, in 1900, about then, wanted no blacks bossing anybody, not even blacks. So they got rid of William Henry. So he was eager to become a preacher, and I assume he did. He married a lot of people there in Virginia. I've looked at all of that. He had somebody to marry almost every week <laughs> when he was a, a preacher. So he had to give up his job. Well, my father, I don't know how this worked out, but he worked for another family named Till Lester, who ran the furniture company. He was told essentially about the same thing because they were getting ready to build a, sh a furniture store that could, would, uh, would uh, manufacture windows and all of those things. So he had to build a factory kind of too. So he got his job, but he said, my father had to give up his job too. So those things have impacted me <laughs> all my life yes, because I used to listen to them talk yeah. and sometimes they knew what, didn't realize I knew what they were talking about, but I did. And I remembered all the names they associated with, but I never heard the the, the Lester say anything about that until I came back from the University of Massachusetts. Now that must have been 20, 20 years later that I had gone up there and got a master's degree. And uh, he, uh, and I came home and I had a sister who had worked in the hospitals during the war year, and she had gone around to see sick patients, and sometimes she saw whites that she knew, and she stopped to see them. And she found out that uh, one of these women knew my father, and she said, well, I'd like for your brother, uh, one of John's sons, I'd like to talk with me. Now, I came home, I guess it was Christmas or something, and she says, would you go by to see this woman? I says, now, who is she? She says she's the cousin of Pop. Now, I never knew that Pop was the cousin to Till Lester's wife. I never knew that. <laughs> My father, usually when he had a conversation like that, he got out of the, my hearing. Distance, so. <laughs> so, 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 I, I talk with my sister. And I said, you know, this woman is still alive. My father has been dead for a long time. What did she do for him when he was alive? And why should I go and talk with? Her? I just couldn't go. And you say about the Scottsboro. 
Well, I guess I was a freshman in high school when I began to read and hear a lot about the Scotch Bird. And uh, to me, they were about my age. And there were white people around us. And we used to be a, one of the biggest pond to go swimming. We used to take the horses, the drag pan, and make a dam across this little stream that ran down from the Morris's place. And we used to make a huge pond there. So everybody that lived in that neighborhood, white and black, came by and saw that lovely pond, wanted to go swimming there. Now, we didn't use swimming suits. <laughs> and the women came in, they would go up the stream, jump in, and swim. So there <laughs> was this man, I assume, he was my mother's first cousin. He was a Morris. And <laughs> he came by with to his daughter and another cousin, who was one of his sister's child. Uh, girls, girls, I should say. I guess they were 12, 14, about the same as age as us. And they wanted to go swimming. And they brought their father. We didn't understand why she had brought him, or why they had brought him. But I guess they brought him to teach him a lesson, that they could go swimming with us, and there was nothing wrong with it. They knew, we knew, they knew, that we were cousins. My mother and her father. My mother and her father were first cousins. And I guess we weren't supposed to know that, but we did. And we told them as much. And my mother was also first cousin to his wife. So I said, Mom, he must have married a cousin. She said, yes, he did. And I knew my mother's first marriage was with someone that was related to her. Whether he was a first cousin or second cousin, I'm not sure, but he was a cousin. So I asked my mother at that stage, why would you marry a cousin? Why didn't you ask him, was he your cousin? She says he didn't know, and I didn't know. So we made a mistake. So we used to tell them about there could be nothing between us and them because we're first cousins. We're second cousins. Yeah. And that's the reason we got some kind of people a little bit crazy yeah. in this family already. So I told them all about that. So this man came along with the two girls and they brought him, they said, well, you can go talk with him. So he came and talked with me and he talked for a long time. So I told them, yes, they could go up there, jump in the water, they could swim, and we, we're not going to grab them and try to hug them. They are our cousins. So eventually, he says, well, go ahead. And, and the daughters had told him before then that he should go home. If he couldn't stand to look at them swim with us, go home, and you won't have to look at us. But he just went out in the woods a short distance, and I could just see him out capturing him on a stick. I don't know what else he was doing. But at the end, he came back to pick up his daughters, and he thanked me for letting them swim. And I don't remember much after that, because I think that next year my father might have died, and I think my full-time work was taking care of the farm. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. And milking the cow yeah. and doing things like that. Yeah. And going to high school yeah. when I could. Right. Yeah. 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 Mrs. Bassett, uh, we'll come back, and this is a, be one of these interviews where we shift back and forth, but <laughs> Mrs. Bassett, can you, um, Dr. Bassett, you mentioned you're getting the master's up at University of Massachusetts, and I think it's in that context that the two of you met. And um, up, up in Massachusetts, and I wondered, Miss Bassett, if you would recall the circumstances and <laughs> how you two came to know each other. Well, um, this was after World War II, and um, 
I went to a women's college, Smith College, in, in Northampton, Massachusetts, and there was a road that ran from Northampton to Amherst. And along that road, there was what was called a, a roadhouse in those days. And this roadhouse became rather uh, notorious because they refused to serve blacks. So some of the Smith women uh, went over to join a picket line. And whether this is apocryphal or <laughs> um, whether that is really the first time we met, um, that's what I remember. And um, then there was a, a lawsuit because some people were arrested. I was not arrested. I seem to have a knack for not getting arrested sometimes. <laughs> And um, so I was a witness at the trial that, you know, the, when the people, you were not arrested either. No. You know. I was not. So, but anyway, we, we got to see one another again after that. And we had friends in Amherst where we were welcome to go for dinner and so forth. And, yeah. So your, your knowledge of that, of that protest would have come through the Progressive Party community Student, student group, or how, how would you have known about that to, to, be, to go and get It could involved? have been, yeah. yes. It would have been. Yes, because I know our lawyer, the lawyer that, um, and he was very careful not to groom me for this uh, when I had to be a witness. He said, I'm not, you know, you just remember yourself just what happened, tell, because I'm not putting any words in your mouth. And of course, I had never done it before. And I went to see the president of the college and tell, told him that I was going to be a witness. And he said, that's fine. That's what you should be doing. So um, yeah. perhaps it was through the, I know the lawyer was uh, part of the Progressive Party. Yeah, and I wanted to ask too, at, at Smith in those years, there would have been what, just maybe a half dozen African-American students on oh. campus, if that? A half dozen would be a lot. Yeah. 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 Four, three, four. Yeah, there were four. There were four uh, years of college, yeah. and in my class, I was in two classes. You know, I was there, and I went. There were certainly never more than two or three. Yeah. 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 So, would that have been your first occasion to become directly and personally acquainted with African Americans, or had you? In oh, in my school. Yeah. Um, I do remember that. Uh, the atmosphere was very supportive of the black students. Um, you mean at Smith or? No, it, at the public school. In Plainfield? In Plainfield, okay, New yeah, Jersey. All right, all right. Uh, their Plainfield, um, we lived in a part of Plainfield that was all white, but there was a small enclave of black families who were mainly uh, working domestics in the households. Uh, and they were in the classes with us. And there was, you know, f to my, well, what, five, sixth grade self, I didn't see that the teachers you know, did any, treated them any differently. And uh, in the eighth grade, we had a cantata. And we sang a Ballad for Americans. And the Paul Robeson's part was played by uh, one of the black students. And of course he was the star. And Paul Robeson did come to Plainfield and he performed at the public library. No, no, at the public high school. And that was a really very impressive and experience you attended. You attended. and I attended. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With yeah. students or with your family? Uh, it's possible my brother yeah. went along, but not my parents. You earlier mentioned your mother had some. Yeah. 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 Let me ask this too, and, and um, as you, after the two of you had met and began to uh, become interested in one another, how did you, I mean, it's obviously a very challenging context for an interracial couple in that era. How did you think about those issues and find your way forward in a context that could be even not just unfriendly, but even hostile sometimes. How about that, Em? What? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I don't remember anybody 
up at the University of, um, of Massachusetts being hostile about seeing us together at, over at the university. Now, I have a suspicion that over at her dormitory, I guess I only went by there a couple of times. I don't remember going more than that. I never went to that party that the woman said she danced yeah, with me. I, <laughs> I don't remember that. <laughs> well, there was a house mother. Yeah. Uh, yes. But she took it in stride. Um, she had had a, a, a really uh, a big uproar the year before because a, a student had become pregnant. And uh, that was uh, monumental. Uh, for the house mother <laughs> and for the and for the student who supposedly didn't know what what had happened but at any rate you know this was not a very enlightened period um, but I uh, you know we, we just felt that it was our right and privilege if we cared for each other to proceed yeah. um, I guess we knew that you know we might uh, encounter some hostility and and uh, personal hostility. I don't remember that at Smith. No. No. Yeah. Dr. Bassett, let me take you back to um, to your move to um, Tuskegee to enter college. And you would have a range of, it sounds like, um, very, very interesting experiences while a student there. And then, of course, would go on into the military service. Yeah. But before the before we get to the Second World War, I'm, I'm, I'd be interested if you would kind of share some recollections of your experiences at Tuskegee. Well, at Tuskegee, I was in or went there as a work study into a work study program. I was going to work. I think it was, may have been 24 hours a week may have been a little longer than that. And I think at some time I gave that up and made it a little shorter because I didn't want to be there for five years. I wanted to try to graduate in four years. So I was trying to take a full load. But that was very difficult because I had to get up at four o'clock in the morning, go milk the cows. And I think I had 13 cows the milk, and they were all Guernsey cows. Be he put me over there, and he used to come around and take a look at me milking these. We were milking by hand at that time. And he says, where did you learn to milk a cow? I said, we had cows at home, and I milked two or three cows all the time there. So that's where I learned to milk cows. So I'm milking here. He used to go around after me to see whether any milk was being left in the cow's bag. I said, no, I make sure that everything is done properly. We did it at home, and I'm not doing anything new here. I wash off of the teats and make sure they're clean. And Oh, there was a wash man. I think he did it before I, I didn't have to do that. So I milked these 13 cows, and that was about uh, I guess there was three other people that milked the Holsteins, which took a little longer, and they gave a little more milk. And, and just to kind of situate this for the for the interview, these were this was part of the school's pro. The, the this was part of the school, and I think they paid us something like fifteen to twenty cents an hour, someplace in there. That's what it was. We didn't get much money for that, and. So I had to do some extra jobs on weekends, like cleaning up the, uh, the lots where the cows were fed during the winter months especially. And, um, and I used to do that. And, um, and sometimes there were people who had other little jobs that they would give to me, like a barbecue or something. I used to stay up all night helping a man barbecue uh, hog meat because Tuskegee were going to have a big uh, feast. At one day a year, they invited the whole community around, and they just cooked a lot of hog meat on the, the uh, 
they w went out in the woods and they dug a trench and they put some bars over it and some stones around. And they j we stayed there all night. And I'd get paid for all night too because he would sleep some and I would sleep some. And this man had this song that he used to sing to me all, uh, that he did all of this for white people too. He wanted me to know that. He said, they certainly have been good to me. I said, how good? Stay up all night cooking their meat? Is that good? You get a little tired sometimes. So he just laughed and went on. Mm -hmm. But he did show me he made up all of the the salt and pepper and everything, and he put that in some kind of fat, and he'd go over the meat every once in a while with that and put it on the meat. Mm -hmm. So I did learn all of those things. Yeah. So I did that for the first two years, and it was tough. I think I got A's in math and A's in a few other things, but there were some courses, I think biochemistry, I think I got an A in that, and the man came to me and he pleaded with me to, he could give me a job there, it'd be much easier, and I could major in biochemistry. But I kept thinking about the farm back home. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know. I said, my father's expecting me to run that. By that time he's dead, and my family still depends on me to run the farm. I had been able to bring in another black person from a white farm, and he worked for this man. I think he got 75 cents a day. We told him we could pay him $2 a day because we traded, sold stuff every weekend in town at the, on the street, and we made some money, enough to pay him $2 an hour whenever he helped up. So he, we had him, so he just gave up his job with this white family and he came to work with us. And he almost looked at us as if we were his children, me and my younger brother. We were it. And uh, the other brothers were into their building business or plumbing business mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. they, Excuse me. Next job. Okay, we're, we're back after a short break. Um, NYA, that was it, wasn't it? The National Youth Administration. Youth Administration. That money. Yeah. Oh, the Roosevelt okay. Administration yeah. gave me. Okay, hold it. I think we're good. We're back. We're good. Uh, yep, we're back on. Thank you. Yeah, I can go over when you get set. We're, we're set. Okay. Yeah, they gave me a, a scholarship. And that is, I think it was supposed to be $25 a month. That was twice what I was making working. And I only worked at Dr. Carver's place for about 12 hours a week, usually about two hours every other day or something like that. And maybe a little more on Saturday and Sunday, showing visitors around. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that was very easy. Now, just how I got there, I've never been able to find out. But I used to have a man at the Labor Department, and oh, he yeah. was a writer. Now, what was his name? Ah. Ralph Ellison. Ralph Ellison. Oh, yeah, you've heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he, he told me that he was going to take care of me. I told him I was working more hours than I was being paid for because if I worked extra time over at the bunk, they didn't want to pay me for it. <laughs> so, so when I got this job, I didn't have to worry about that anymore. And I had more time to study. And I got to meet Dr. Carver and I worked with his postdoc that was, was a, one of his assistants. Yeah. Let me ask, how did, uh, we'll come to Dr. Carver in just a moment, but how did you come to meet Ralph Ellison? Well, he was at Tuskegee for some reason, and he was working in that department. And I used to go by there. But I didn't, 
didn't realize till later that he had written the book. That much had, later. Yeah. Much later. Yeah. I put it together. Yeah. That's who I was ta talking to. Yeah. But I never knew. Yeah. No. And how about Dr. Carver? What was the experience like of being being in? Did, did he? Was he someone that you could have a fairly close personal? academic context relationship with, or was he someone who had such stature that there was a distance between him and his students? I, I, I don't think he ever had a, that distance mm. between me and one other fellow that worked there. Two of us got those scholarships, mm. and we used to, when we first get the work, he wanted to see us for about a half hour, just sit and talk. And I remember I was just beginning to grow a little beard, and he used to take his hands and all fill across it. You just like, yeah, yeah, you just like a little spring chicken. You just growing up, and so I, you know, asked this, my supervisor, you know, why does he do that? And he told me now this. I got it from him. I haven't seen it written down that he was, well, I should I say castrated as a young baby because they wanted him to be a wagon driver. Now, uh, so uh, he felt that was the reason he had never grown a beard himself. He had a few whiskers around here, but I don't think he even shaved. And he says because he was castrated as a young kid. So, yeah. very sad, so but what can you do yeah. about it? And I think at that stage, he was about 70 years old. I think he died at 71 or two. And I think I had just gone home, and I had a picture I was going to Stop by there the next time I went down to Tuskegee and get it autographed. But before I got back to that, he was dead. Yeah. How did you make the um, How did you make the determination as you were completing your college years? How did you How did you navigate the choice between the responsibility of perhaps going back to take over the farm? Yeah. Or going off for graduate school. Of course, the war would intervene, but also yeah, the you, war did intervene. How did you make that? How'd you make that choice? To well, it was kind of made for me with the Army and all of that, because I'd already signed up, and I think I'd gotten a couple of letters from them that, you know, there are things that you can volunteer for and you won't be drafted. And that was the Tuskegee Army Air Force that they were establishing then, and I was I think 18 when they started after me. And I wrote my mother a long letter that she would have to uh, approve of me going into this. And there was another option I had was to go to Fort Valley after I finished college. And if I did volunteer there to become an Army officer, they could, uh, I could go there for I think it may have been six months or it was 90 days. I don't remember what it was. But I could take that. That was another option. And another option was go someplace in Texas and become a warrant officer. But that was training for that. I could volunteer for that. So I wrote my mother and told her those were the options I had and would she approve of that. She wrote me back a long letter approving. She says, I think you know what you want to do, and I think you know more about it than I do. But I want to tell you this, that uh, nobody in our family who ever volunteered for the Army came home. They all got killed. Now. I had to stop and think about that because she put down some names. There was an Uncle Willie. I said, Mom, I never heard of an Uncle Willie. So he must have been your brother, cousin. No, he was 
my uncle, my great uncle, he went to the Alamo out in, in Texas, and he was killed there. I said, but Uncle Willie, I'm talking about somebody <laughs> who looked like me. She says, no, he looked more white than he did black. And he went out there, and he was killed there. But he's still your uncle. And then she went. You remember what his last name was? Obadiah. No. Who, oh, Willie? Willie? Travis. He was killed at the Alamo. You can read that in history books, but they never say that he was black. Okay. I don't know that he was either, because that one of these grandmothers back there were supposedly white. I'm not sure about that, but and uh, oh, different fathers. Different maybe. fathers. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, but were you, in the end, um, what was your decision about whether or not to join the segregated armed forces as a volunteer? Yeah. Well, I never wanted to go to prison. Yeah. And that's what I'd had a couple of people who had gone that route, was going to prison. I said, gee, you know. This what? is after you're drafted? No, no. Oh. before I was drafted. Conscientious I, I, objectors went to prison. Yeah, uh, you, yeah, yes. went yeah. to prison. The only ones I knew went to prison. And I didn't want to go to prison. So I went to my draft board in Modernsville. And, you know, they had the Modernsville 7 and Modernsville. I was away at that time. I probably at the University of Massachusetts part of it anyway. Now, you're getting your time mixed up here because the draft was before you went to Massachusetts. Yeah. Before you went in the Army. Yeah. But you'll get to that later. Yeah. The okay. Martinsville 7. Yeah. But well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get into that. The only thing I'm saying that one of the members of the draft board was Whittle. And oh. Whittle was the, the judge. Was oh. on the draft board. Yeah. Oh, the, and yeah. there was a couple of other people yeah. that lived around that was running a dairy farm. So I was telling them that, you know, I've already kind of, you know, talked with a man that his son is going away to the army and I could buy the, his 10 cows and I could go into a dairy business myself. And uh, he and I guess the whole group there said, well, you know, we are having such a poor turnout of blacks who are failing the physical. And so uh, you're in good shape, so we want to draft you. I said, <laughs> You want to draft me because somebody else? Failed. I said, you have more to do with that than I do. <laughs> you know, they work for you. Some of these people that got a draft, I got a deferment, work for you. Two members, Brad Shaw and the other one I knew, and I told them so. So I don't have anybody that works for you. I've never worked for anybody that my grandfathers or fathers worked for. So I just told them that. They just looked at each other. They never answered me. <laughs> um, after, um, after this experience with the draft board, ultimately you would go, I think, into the Quartermaster Corps. Yeah, Is I went right? to the Quartermaster Corps. Yeah. Yeah. And in there, I, I ran in, I don't know, I guess at Camp Lee, I went to a special outfit at Camp Lee after I finished my whatever course in that they taught you there. There was two courses, one being a soldier and the other one uh, uh, about the Quartermaster Corps. I took both of those and I made very high grades and all of that. and. Uh, they send me, when I finish, to Company E, which was essentially the, comp the company that 
most of the people there were controlled by, let me see, uh, Colonel Snowden, who was black. He was the highest ranking black officer at Camp Lee. So I went to work for him. And I was called up several times, I don't know why, that they had a new job for me. And I, once I went to a meeting, I guess there was a thousand people there. They were all white. And <laughs> I, remember this I walked up to the <laughs> front and took a seat. And there was a young woman there, I guess from Petersburg. She walked over and says, would I go and sit in the back seat? So I just said to her, I said, if you don't want me here, why don't you just tell me to go outside? You put me in the back. And she looked at me, <laughs> and I walked on outside. And 10 minutes later, a young officer, who probably was white, he was white, and older than me, came out and got me. But they never told me what they, why I was called up there. Mm. It was all white, mm. nothing. I saw no black, nothing. Let's pause for just a second. Okay, we're back. Okay, we're back on. Um, any memories, in particular, I'm sure many do, but are there memories that you would like to share concerning your military service and kind of the, I'm thinking of the, I'm thinking of the, um, you know, experience of as was so commonly reported by black servicemen who served in Second World War, it's this, yeah. this profound irony of fighting, quote, on behalf of freedom and in, in, you know, across the Atlantic Ocean, and then you come back to return to life in a sharply segregated society. Yeah. Just wondering if, if there are, if the, if the experience of fighting in a segregated armed forces altered, adjusted, shifted your perspectives about race relations in the United States, or, or were they? Well, I, I just stayed at Camp Lee, yeah. and I stayed in uh, Company E, yeah. and most of the people there were professors. Some of them were college presidents. Some of them were all kinds of professional people. That's mostly who I was around. And I used to go into work there, and I guess I found out more about this company when I met a fella who was rooming with me at the time named Robert Mang, M-I-N-G. The attorney? He was an attorney, yeah. and he was, uh, I think, arguing the case before the Supreme Court. Yeah. And he went to A.P. Hill. We had to go up there every, I think maybe about every six months I would have to go, and sometimes we would go there together, Maine. And at the last time, there was a big stir in France about some soldiers getting extreme punishment for this or that or the other, and they, want, they gave Robert Maine a captain or maybe they gave him a colonel or something. And he was shipped in Europe to help rectify some of these mistreatment that blacks were complaining about there in France. So um, he, he asked me, he says, you never come down. Everybody there wants to be known. And they want to be known by the officers. That was a captain, that was a a, se a first lieutenant, a second lieutenant, and maybe, I think, uh, somebody else there that I knew. But I never go went down to talk with any of them. Only thing that I did was just report for my work and do it and go home, go back to my room. <laughs> yeah. So they seemed to have liked that. But he told me, Maine did, that Everybody is around trying to build themselves up. So there was a, f a second, a first, lo a second lieutenant there. Uh, he didn't like me at all. 
and I never had much to say to them, and he didn't have much to say to me. So one day I ended up at A.P. Hill with him in charge, and he told me when I got back to, to the company, he was going to have me, I was a sergeant then, he was going to make me a private again. I said, what? For what? He says, you are not doing all the things I'm telling you to do. I said, well, I tell you, and I haven't broken any rules as far as I know. So he went back and told the, the colonel that, and the colonel just, I was told, just laughed, and says, you must have provoked him some way if he said anything to you, because he never said anything to me. Um, after the war, what was the, um, what drove your decision to apply to the University of Massachusetts? How did you reach that? Okay, we'll talk. Well, as far as I could see, I, I came out of the Army. I got a job teaching agriculture in Henry County. And I was liking that job reasonably well. You know, you got a car, you got about $90 a month, and most people around was making 60 or 70 a month. I got a little more money than they did. I worked 12 months in a year, and it was kind of interesting. But after two years, and there were more people coming home from the Army, and uh, there was a part of the county extended down to watch Axton, Virginia. It's going, the road going to Dansville. 58 went right through Axton, Virginia. And and there were some big plantations down there. And there was a couple of bankers who were establishing uh, they were establishing some kind of a program for blacks returning from the army that they could s study agriculture and, and go to school on their plantation, and I was supposed to be the teacher. And he said the superintendent had approved of that, but I'd never approved of it. And the only thing I could see that this would work out for them, they were going to get $75 a month, and these farms were going to get some of this government money to pay for this school that they were going to have on the plantation. So I was supposed to be in charge of that. So I just told them one day that I could never be a person that's training somebody to be a sharecropper. And that's the only thing. After three years, this program was going to run out. And what were they going to do? And they would be on the farmer's land in his house with three or four kids probably, maybe two, maybe just one, maybe none. But anyway, they would be stuck on that plantation for the rest of life. I told them I just couldn't do that. I told two of them, two bankers, and they own huge plantations, probably thousands of acres of land, lots of tobacco. Yeah. And all the farmers I saw on them were black. Right. Right. Yeah. It's interesting, when we went with Julian Bond on the foot, in the footsteps of the Civil Rights Movement tour, uh, we met a young white professor from a, a school. He was from a college in the South, wasn't Mississippi. he? Mississippi. From Mississippi. And he knew about that program. Emmett had never known anybody else who... I never knew anybody knew anything else. anything about knew. that program. Yeah, interesting. But he was right. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Ms. Gassett, let me ask you, um, after you met and married in, in uh, uh, 1950, you, you, you both would move, of course, together to Columbus, Ohio for, as you pursued your graduate work. And um, I'm interested in the experiences of, of uh, you had in Columbus and you would continue your efforts in civil rights. But also, let me, let me ask you, and, and maybe as you, as you describe some of that time there, 
Uh, I wonder too if um, any early stirrings of kind of considerations of women's status and issues played in, in your mind, if that had been touched up against your life at that point at all? Well, that really came out in retrospect, I guess. Um, but we, we first went to New York and were there for a couple of years. And um, I had wanted to go to law school, but that didn't work out because by then, I guess I'd been kind of sidetracked be because of Emmett, but also I, there was no money for me to go to graduate school. So I got a job with the New York Public Library as an intern, and it was a wonderful program. It was a very excellent program. And, but this was putting me into women's work, library, nursing, school teacher. Um, but I must say that it, it wasn't uh, freighted with a lot of regret. No, no. Because, yeah, at Can that I point. Can I ask one question? Please. Yeah. Um, back, back in Amherst, was Wally Nelson and Juanita Nelson? Were Wally and Juanita Nelson in Amherst when you were there? Wally and Anita Nelson. Mm. Never mind. Did Amherst. you know? They must have come I don't anybody know. Her name. Yeah. Yeah. Wally. Wally. Nelson. Wally Nelson. No. They must have come later. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, going, uh, the women's movement didn't, uh, I mean, it was very clear to me that there were these patterns that you were supposed to follow. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, I was already not following <laughs> one of the big ones. <laughs> so, um, when we got to Columbus, um, I went to work in the library there, and I found out through a neighbor that I could get a job at General Motors and make much, much more money. And so I did. And that was, of course, women's work also. Although I was on the production line, um, that was all women in those positions. The skilled tradesmen were men and predominant, almost exclusively white. But um, there were um, there were uh, black women working in, on the production line. Uh, but I, I'll just tell you a small story about that. When I first went. Uh, to be interviewed for the job, to apply for the General Motors job. Uh, I sat next to some people in the waiting room, and a, a black woman, um, when I asked her, did she know anything about buses? I don't know how I got there, but anyway. I think I might have taken that. Did we, we didn't have a car. I, oh Maybe you yeah. borrowed one. Maybe but anyway, she said, well, I'll take you into town, and then you can get a, a bus up to the college, university. So I did, and I got to be friends with her. Um, but before that happened, before we be really became friends, um, I went back to work, and I went into the uh, washroom, and there was this black woman, and she looked very much like the woman that I had been helped out by. Uh, but she looked different because she had a wig on, and that always threw me when people, you know, would change wigs and stuff like that. So anyway, I thought, well, if I don't speak to her, she'll say, oh, these white women, they're all the same, and, you know. And if I do speak to her, she'll think that I think all black women look the same. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really, but I said, oh, the heck with that, I'm going to say hi. And I said hi, and we... You know, we had a nice friendship after that. Right. But she was on uh, probation for 90 days before she could get a job on the production line. And so she worked in the washroom during that period. And she had worked in Curtis Wright factory during World War II. She had real factory experience. I had worked a couple of months in a spiral, uh, uh, 
Sperry gyroscope factory in Plainfield grinding lenses. So I had no, you know, that wasn't anything much. Yeah. But she was experienced and this was the way they played. Well, I became active in the union after that because I said, that's got to stop. Mm -hmm. Not that it stopped, but, you know. Yeah. And you would have, you would um, soon effectively be in the role of a shop steward, as I understand. Yes, I was. Yeah. yeah. And that was very unusual. Years later, uh, a friend, uh, the daughter of a friend of mine who is active in the UAW said, there weren't any women stewards. And I said, oh, yes, there were. <laughs> <laughs> and mm -hmm. I was it. Yeah. But that was in that plant. I don't know what went on everywhere else. It sounds as if, and, and you can tell me if this is correct or not, it sounds as if experiences like that would have confirmed your sense of... Justice. Injustice. <laughs> rather than altered yeah. it tremendously, but rather well, sort of confirmed and deepened it, maybe? They confirmed it, and they also gave me the sense that I could do something about it. And that's really been the guiding light, that you don't just sit back and let it happen, even though I must say <laughs> I don't think we've gotten very far, but I still, I have hope. In, in, you were in Columbus in 1954. Yes, we were. When the Brown decision yeah. came down. When what? When the, the Brown, Brown decision, decision came down. Came down. May, of course, yeah. and then, of course, the late summer of 55 is the horrible experience with the Till murder. Yeah. yeah, and I know, um, um, Dr. Be Dr. Barrett, that you um, moved out. Uh, you uh, made an effort to uh, raise money for yeah. Emmett Till's mother. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We had a big meeting at one of the Baptist church. I think we raised three thousand dollars, and there were some people who felt we shouldn't have sent it all to her because she was. Well, I don't know. They just felt that she was just going to not use it wisely is all I could see. But I didn't see anything wrong with giving it to her. Yeah. yeah. She'd gone through enough. Yeah. And you also went out in the park and collected money there. Yeah. We, yeah. we collected money down at the, yeah. at the, at the um, state capitol. That's where those mm -hmm. pictures were taken. Yeah, you're alluding to there was an article coverage of your effort to raise that money in, in the crisis, the NAACP yeah. publication. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Did did your did your effort in a public context like that in Columbus in the mid '50s did that cause you any problems inside your academic program? Huh. <laughs> I guess so. I guess so because uh, you know when I. Uh, was getting ready to, I guess I was about ready to get graduate. And uh, I was, uh, uh, teaching, they decided that I hadn't had any exp teaching experience since I had been at Ohio State. And they wanted to give me some because they had just gotten a report that most students who do well on their qualifying exam have had some teaching experience because you learn things and learn it well when you teach it. So they decided I should teach a course. So I taught a course and uh, after I finished teaching this course, uh, the uh, two of the students who took this course on the me and another fella, I, I think his name was Kenneth Fox, but it's, it doesn't mean too much. I don't think he's still alive. I think he died. And uh, he was a very talented and a very honest person. And I think he had gone to Uppsala because I went to Uppsala for a year and I think he's the one that encouraged me to go there, too. So I thought he was a very nice fellow. But the thing that bothered me, since I had these two students and I was going 
to Chicago. I'd gone there several times, and every place who wanted me sent me a ticket to fly up, kept me in the best hotel, the Palmer House, or the whatever, the Hilton House, or whatever it was, to add those places for two weeks to look for jobs in Chicago. And they all said, if they hired me, the whole top would go off of that building. That's what they said. The man at, uh, let me see, what was that? Uh, and the name of the company, it, it, it was, you remember? Real Lemon? No, no, Real Lemon all the music. Oh, job. no, no, they don't. That was, uh, it, it, it. Oh, oh. Mm. We'll, we'll make a note of it later, because I know it's Yeah, great. I can pick that up. I, I have it written down in there. It, it's something like. Beatrice Foods. Beatrice yeah. Foods, yeah. yeah. That, that's what the man told me that. He would give anything to hire me. But he had hired a Chinese technician, and he almost lost his job off of that. Everything there was white. It was in the heart of the black community. And These were the, all dairy, uh, food related, dairy related? Yeah. Technology well, jobs? Yeah. yeah. Your PhD made you the, as, as far as you're aware, the first African American person. Yeah. Really person of African descent to take a PhD in dairy science perhaps yeah ever yeah yeah as far as I know yeah. Yeah. because at Tuskegee the man had an MS he got yeah. it from Wisconsin I think yeah and most other place and I did get a lot of letters from a lot of college one college I guess maybe two Florida and Georgia yeah. they wanted us to come right away <laughs> to come and teach yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not knowing that you were African American. Yeah. No, right, right. Not, no, no. These were African American oh, schools. Were, ah, I see. But okay. yes. of course we couldn't because of miscegenation yeah. laws. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so you, you very consciously would not make, you would not have moved to the South in those years. No. Well, I don't think he would yes. have had the job. Right. Be, these were state right. Right. universities. The, I think yeah. they yeah. were. Yeah. This was before the sure. Loving versus, versus Virginia. Virginia yeah. Yeah. 1967. Yeah. yeah. So we had uh, of course. 17 years of <laughs> being illegal in some places. Sure. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not that we it. thought about it much, uh, except in Virginia. Yeah. Yeah. That was a difficulty. Yeah. Yeah. So you um, you took a job in New York. Y yeah, I worked for Sheffield Farm. That, that was, was big. Di huh. No, this was after Columbus. You had gone to Sheffield Farm oh, I after took, Massachusetts. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that was after uh, Massachusetts, yeah. I took a job there. And, uh, uh, at Columbia University? At yeah. Columbia University, yeah. yes. Yes, I went there, and I, they had some jobs in the Department of Microbiology. It was changing over and they wanted people with a chemistry background. And I had thought about this when I was going to Ohio State. If I couldn't get a job in dirty technology, I can get one in organic chemistry. And I took all the organic chemistry courses, and uh, uh, they asked me would I like to take a course in advanced physical chemistry, and I could get a PhD in chemistry. But uh, I had made A's in all these advanced courses and uh, physics, but I just thought that in advanced uh, physical chem, I would need a little more math, and I didn't want to go take another math course. I had had calculus, but <laughs> that was enough. We had very poor training in mathematics in high school, elementary school. We didn't have anything at all. We didn't have people who could teach you square root. And I remember learning that from a book that uh, one of the people that we were trading with, her son died, and he, she told me I could have all of his books. 
and I saw that white students in Virginia had physics, they had uh, uh, a math, a different math, calculus, some calculus in high school, yeah. but I didn't have any of that. Mm -hmm. and Let's pause for just one sec here. We are back after a break for lunch. Thank you for a lovely lunch. It was um, delightful, and um, you have very kindly but firmly instructed me to, to say Priscilla and Emmett. So with your permission, I will do that uh, as, we, as we move through the second half of our interview. Um, Priscilla, if you would, can you talk a little bit about some of the, we're gonna turn back to Columbus for, for, for a bit, and um, there were a number of ramifications, I guess, that followed from your sort of becoming identified as a, as a forceful advocate in the union context and perhaps otherwise, yeah. Well, yes, I was a member of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, which was founded by Jane Addams in World War I. And um, it was a, a very congenial group of women. There were maybe some men, but not, not in Columbus, but in New York there were. But um, that got Emmett into a little trouble because uh, when he was being considered for a position at Ohio State, which he, you hadn't applied for, they were just looking into it, right? And looking into it, and they, the apartment had agreed that they would give me this assistant professor yeah. job yeah. at Columbus, at Ohio State. So uh, anyway, you were asked to visit with the FBI? Yeah, he because says, of, uh, I mean, I'll tell wife. you, and maybe this is wrong, maybe I forgot. He told me that— This is the head of the department. Head of the department. Dr. Gould. Dr. Yeah. Gould. And he came to me and said that uh, they weren't concerned about me, but they were concerned about some of your friends at, that had come to our house. And the only thing I knew was there was a woman who was a friend of Priscilla's uh, to some extent. I don't know how much, but she had been to our house. And I was down at uh, Ohio State's, the university hospital, and I met her with her husband, and she introduced me to her husband. He was a doctor there in some position at the medical school. Well, I guess that was um, I, I don't know. Mir. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. We I, know we but never anyway, did I figure out tell who it was, so don't use that name because I don't know that that would be true. I don't either. But um, anyway, she, um, I mean, I, I didn't really know what they were talking about. Well, I told them that <coughs> I was not, I didn't feel good. I wouldn't go and talk with the FBI or CIA or whatever they <laughs> were. I didn't know yeah. which it was. But I told him that I wouldn't want to talk with either one of them. So uh, that was it. And he said, well, you know, the university have that as a policy now that we have just been censored by the uni Association of University Professors, and and I told them that I belonged to that organization, and I wouldn't want to go and talk with any any of that group. And he says, "Well, you can't get the job." I said, "I don't want that job <laughs> if that's what I have to do." Yeah. But we, on a personal level, we we wow. had trouble swimming. With the kids, yeah, um, the swimming pools were closed, and so we used to go to this beautiful lake uh, called Lake Hope, which we really enjoyed going to. That yeah. was great. So when we went out to Columbus to a family reunion, not having known there was any family in Columbus, um, we went to Lake Hope with our granddaughter, yeah. and we had a fun. Yeah. Fun time. Would there be other instances when you would sort of, uh, this was the, the episode you just recounted, I'm, I'm presuming it was sort of a red scare kind of. Yes, that, that's yeah, what yeah. it was. Um, were there other instances then in 
in throughout the remainder of the 50s, early 60s, where those same kinds of pressures were brought to bear on you, just sort of out of the Cold War, I mean, Red Scare context? Out of that. You mean r racial you only? No, no, sorry. Oh. Are there other instances oh. where some of the, um, where you encountered more concerns about you that came sort of focused through the lens of the Red Scare rather than through a racial Well, lens? I also had a visit from the FBI. Uh -huh. And I told them I was sorry. I was hanging clothes out in the <laughs> in the yard <laughs> where we lived. I said I really wasn't available for <laughs> a talk. Uh, so that was the end of that. But um, as far as jobs were concerned, it never was a problem for me. No. And um, not in Columbus or in uh, in New York. So. Yeah. Um, Dr. Bassett, when you, when you came um, to New York, uh, ultimately, with the Columbia uh, University yeah. position, I, I'd love to have you just sketch in general terms some of your uh, uh, scholarly and academic work, because you would obviously have a long career as a uh, professor and, and researcher, and I'm, uh, I know our interview is not going to be about the science and all of that work, but I'd love to just have a basic description of all that work. Yeah, well, at Columbia, now, they gave me a salary. I, I guess it was came off a grant. And the only way that they could pay me is if we brought in enough money in grants to pay for my salary. And the man that I was working with, who was at that time, I think, assistant professor, and he had to pay a good portion of his salary. And the technician, we had to pay for. And, and we had to pay if they wanted to take a course, that came out of our grants too. So we had to have grants. So the idea was, I think the first year I was there, or maybe it was the second, I don't remember precisely, we had made about five publications, big publications on the biosynthesis of patulin. We were also looking at different amino acids and how the, uh, the, 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 the two amino acids that were, had a benzene ring, we were wondering how they formed, so we looked into that, and we did publish a little note about it. But the man that I work with, I wanted to publish the whole thing and probably do some more work. He says, I don't, I've spent all the money, so I can't go back. But I found out later that some of the people at Rockefeller Institute was also working on this. And he said, they're going to read this. And if they, if you write this paper like you're going to write it, he says, it'll never get published because that is their field. And they were just turned down. I didn't know all of that politics was in to that type of work. So I just went along with it. Okay, you just write in what you think is safe and we'll publish that. So the, if you want to know what that was, you know, we had, um, they, no, no, what is it? Uh, gosh, I forget about all these amino acids and how many times do I know them. But the two that are aromatics is tyrosine and phenylalanine. Mm -hmm. Now, we wanted to find out where they synthesized like some more benzene rings were being synthesized by this fungus we were working with. And I found out that tyrosine and phenylalanine probably same came from the same uh, oh, what do you want to call that uh, from this came from the same precursor, I guess I should call it yeah. came from the same precursor and 
These people had it down that you had phenylalanine that was formed and uh, tyrosine was formed from phenylalanine. Well, I put some radioactive material in some, uh, some of the synthesis that we were doing, and I found out that more uh, uh, of the, the tyrosine had more of the radioactive carbons in it than phenylalanine. So it couldn't be coming from phenylalanine. But he decided if we didn't want to put that, we'd put it in as a kind of a temporary note that we noted that. And so a few weeks later, I think it was two people who had gotten the note, not the Nobel Prize. I don't know what they had, but anyway, they were, had gotten some, a lot of rewards for what they had done. Maybe they got the, some kind of a prize, but he says they would never approve of this. So we published it his way, and that got published. So that year, we published five different papers, and enough to get us a lot of grant money the next year. So that we worked against, but <coughs> you weren't completely free to publish anything you wanted to publish. And um, I think three or four months later, they republished their work, and they published it and right? said, they, they came from a common precursor, but they didn't come at the same sequence as the, both of them came at different points in the development of the organism. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. we wanted to say that too, but he wouldn't put it. He and he was putting most of the money into the research I was doing. Yeah. Because at that time, I was just, uh, just postdoc at that just point. Just a postdoc yeah. at that time. Did those, did those, uh, was that publishing question, uh, uh, did that reflect, that was straightforward academic politics, not racial politics. Is that correct or no? You don't know. I, I, I think it's academic. Okay. okay. Yeah. I, I think yeah. it's there. Yeah. These other folks you were working with at Columbia were white. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they were white. And uh, this group down at, um, at, uh, hmm, I'm trying to think. Rockefeller, was it? Rockefeller Institute. They had much more money than we did, and they had a lot of postdoc, and they had a lot of people who had worked there for a long time with those people at, at, uh, at uh, Rockefeller. So they kind of had a corner on that, and they would look at us as putting in so what they probably would say to us that, you know, you haven't done enough research on this to make that statement. So they went back and there were three different groups. I don't, can't recall all, what all three of them were, but they agreed that they both would say that they had redone the work and they published again of how it worked and it was the same thing that I wanted to publish. Yes. I never got a chance. Exactly. Yeah. How did your um, How did your uh, lives as as activists on the question of racial equality How did those How, how did that unfold in, in after you settled in New York in the mid nineteen fifties Because the uh, I mean Little Rock's fifty seven Oh well Montgomery's the year before that Little Rock's fifty seven Greensboro kicks off the sort of major wide open. Uh, demonstration phase of the movement. What was the pattern of your involvement across those years? Priscilla, do you want to describe that? Well, um, let's see, our, our daughter uh, was going to public school. This was just on our part in our personal lives. And um, she was in kindergarten. And the school it was a very large class with two teachers. And um, we had the opportunity to send uh, the, uh, her to private school, to an ethical culture school, the Fieldston School. 
which was in a rural part, <laughs> not so rural, but you know, a, a, a less urban section of New, New York City, Riverdale, New York, and a lot of a nice campus and good teachers and so forth. Um, now, I was not in favor of leaving the public school system, but I also knew how Emmett felt having gone to a one-room segregated school where the teachers rarely finished the school year and he had only one teacher that he really connected with in his whole life there. So uh, I would certainly defer. Uh, and I was convinced of that when I met Mae Mallory, who was a um, colleague of, of uh, Robert Williams in North Carolina, right? Um, Mae Mallory was a, a real activist, and yeah. um, I happened to be sitting with her at lunch uh, at a meeting on the New York City public school system, and I told her my dilemma, and she said, no dilemma, you just send your child where that child will get the best education. And she said, you can keep on fighting for what you believe in. It doesn't mean you won't. And so that convinced me that I would defer <laughs> to <laughs> Emmett. And so we did with our three kids. But Emmett, um, I mean, we, I think you more than I actually got involved in that uh, business with the integration of the uh, middle schools in Washington Heights. Yeah, I forgot and all about there was that. A, there was a, also a freedom school that we had um, where the children went in a, a Methodist church uh, in yeah, I think Riverdale was, yeah. or Kingsbridge. Kingsbridge. And, yeah, and, and then when there was a big Brownsville issue, Ocean Hill Brownsville, uh, we tried to keep the local school open, uh, not with the not with the regular teachers, but the teachers who were willing, you know, to uh, to support community-based uh, uh, school boards. Yeah, so that you know, even though I was a mother in a private school, I was still involved. Yeah. So and Emmett also. I mean, I think you were on the front page of the Daily News for yeah. ticketing somewhere. I know we never had that. Feel <laughs> car tank up with sugar. And yes, they filled our car tank up with sugar, and we had to have that pumped out. Washed uh, out. <laughs> very angry people. This was in Washington Heights. Yeah. Um, about these middle schools. So um, we were trying to, they had three junior high schools, and we were trying to get them to integrate into each one of them takes so many whites, so many blacks. You get a kind of balance. And they were in a good geographic area yeah. where they were fairly close together. Yeah. Nobody would have to travel. Travel far. Very long distance. Some of the blacks would go here, some go here, and some would go in the home district, and white students would come into that too. And we thought we had worked it out, but we came back and we found out that everybody who was supporting us had gotten fired or something. Oh, the was, principal yeah, or something. Yeah, the principal. Is that yeah. right? They fired the principal? Yeah. 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 So it was bad times. Yeah. So this would have been what years, year or years? Mm. Yeah, I really look. Well, when did Mitzi start to feel some? Because they used to come and tell me, you don't send your kids there. Yes, they, we did get that. Yeah. Uh, well, we were, were we living in uh, we were living in houses then? Or we were living in... I think we were living in, it would be in, in the early 60s. Yeah, early 60s. Yeah. Early yeah, 60s. Yeah. We were living in uh, a co-op. Co-op at yeah. that time. Yeah. Would your children ever come back into the New York City public schools or no? No, no, okay. no yeah. they went all the way through. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I know, Dr. Bassett, that you had a very uh, interesting engagement with the planning for the march in Washington. 
Yeah, but uh, I guess I was kind of recruited by, uh, what's his name? By Rustin? No. No. No, Bob, our neighbor, our, he was a neighbor and friend, Bob Lewis. Bob Lewis. Oh. But who know. recruited him? Well, I think that uh, he probably was recruited by uh, uh, Sid, uh, Sid. Oh, the one that supported Martin Luther King. He used to come up every week. You mean Stan Levison? Stan Levison. Stan Levison. Yeah, I keep thinking okay. Sid, but yeah. Stan. Who had been in in friendship? This was in friendship. Yeah. In friendship. Yeah, I was in that, and when I went into that, Bob Rustin had left this group and had gone to Africa to try to stop the French bombing. I oh. never saw him at a meeting. Testing. Testing, and uh, when I he came back to the country, we were had a meeting at the. Apollo Theater in Harlem, and that's when they, uh, 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 we turned it back over to A. Philip Randolph, and he had all the people he had chosen to work with, I guess, uh, NAACP and so forth, all the churches. We turned all of that over to him. But you had recruited a, a lot of buses. I remember there was a threshold that he wanted before he would commit himself, right? Well, we, we figured yeah. we had enough uh, 100,000 people. Yeah. Yeah. And I think they felt that was that in it was friendship. I mean, Emmett was a part of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just a part of that. And you went to Washington? Yeah. Yes, we did go. Yeah. Yeah. Can you share a your. And we had been to the prayer pilgrimage also. And. A lot of people don't remember that, mm -hmm. but Can that was very the prayer, moving. The, the prayer pilgrimage. Yes, that yeah. was very moving. Can you describe uh, that experience? Well, <laughs> we had the, our two two children with us at that. Yeah. Did we drive down there? I think I so. I and think I think we Buzzy went. Was that the one? No, I no, don't not Buzz. No, I don't think so. Um, you know, I I get a little. It was by the reflecting pool, and Dr. King, it was the first time that I had ever heard him speak, and that was very moving, and that's what I remember. Um, now, that was when you went down and from friend, Columbus. No, no, this, this was, we were living in, in Brownsville, Brownsville, in Brooklyn. Yeah, no. when we came back, we had a hard time finding an apartment in New York City. So this was what, 1956, right after the bus boycott, mm -hmm. was his real debut, so to speak, on the public, yeah. Was that the instance where the, the landlord um, changed your law? Oh, that happened when we, before, just before we were married. It happened uh. the week before we were married, I think. We had just moved in, um, not ourselves, but we had moved in some blankets and things. And yeah. I don't know what we thought we were going to sleep on. Well, we had we're we going had to bring some more. Yeah, things. we had some other things that we were. But going we to just bring. put enough in there to claim the apartment. Yeah. And uh, when we went back, yes, yeah, sure the door enough, was locked. I went back. Yeah. You went back. The door was locked. Yeah. I went there. It was locked. Yeah. Key didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite a shock. A shock. I went over and talked to the man. And he says, well, I want to give you your, the barber. He says, I want to give you your money back. I said, but no, that's not what we want. We want the apartment. And he says, well, I was told not to give it to you. Huh. Yeah, the key. Yeah. We did have some housing things. But to finish up on um, the education, um, both of us tried to blend our our work lives with our activism, and I was, uh, uh, I participated in the Council on Interracial Books for Children, which encouraged um, publishers to publish books by African American, or as we use the word black, and I still do, but African American uh, authors and illustrators, and also uh, popularized the books, and um, that was 
you know, a, a very, uh, very good way to, because I was a children's librarian. And well, that would be a theme through all your professional uh, work in, in um, as a librarian. That, that yes, we're well, all of developing curriculum, yeah. book collection, everything. Yeah, yes, I, I really was very key. And I believe also related to the theme of your master's thesis when you got your MLA. Of what? Also related to your master's thesis theme. Oh yes, when my you master's. Got your MLS. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I uh, I was urged to publish it, but um, at the time I didn't think it was appropriate for me as a white woman to um, publish it. That mm. you know I, I was I was having a, a certain advantage in getting getting that published that white skin privilege. <laughs> And that I really didn't think that was appropriate, and so I don't know that anybody's ever published anything. But I did go back, and many of the books are out of print, and I'm sad about that. Yeah. Because the whole theme of that was uh, the rejection of a child's first language when he or she goes into uh, the formal education uh, has a very alienating effect. Absolutely. And let me say, just for the for the record, the, the your Queens College 1977 master's uh, thesis title was The Black Idiom, Libraries and Children's Books. Yeah. How'd you find that out? Well, in this instance, very, quite easily, you sent me, <laughs> the, you sent me the CD. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> oh a, I put it on there. One. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I think I was applying for a job which I really didn't want, but they wanted me to apply for that too. You know, Queens College really, uh, they, they tried to do right by me. <laughs> yeah. Are there other parts of your long pattern of, of engagement with progressive struggle that that are related, because of course the, the Vietnam War would become a, a focus of your activism in the late six, later in the 60s, but staying, say, to the front half of the 60s, were there other things that stand out about the community of progressive activism in New York and, and your connections to that community? The early 60s, I early guess I reconnected with the we, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and I how I ever saved it, I don't know, but I, g I gave a talk on uh, war toys, I remember. So that was certainly a, a part of... Uh, children's toys. It became very important mm -hmm. to me. I'm sorry, you meant children's toys, war toys. Yes, yes war right, toys. Right, yeah, right. children's war yeah. toys. Yeah. Um, what else was happening in the early 60s? Well, uh, they didn't want us to, at, at what is it, 33? Hillside. Oh, Fort George Avenue? Yeah. They didn't want us to give our meetings inside of that. Oh, that's right. That's one reason that I wanted to leave. Yeah. We were in a cooperative, Mitchell Lum cooperative. This was a state program that um, subsidized, it wasn't low income, but it was middle, um, middle income um, families, uh, apartments. And uh, we moved in there, and it was a, a wonderful place. We, in advance to moving, we had meetings, and there was a cooperative board, and we designed the uh, playground that we wanted to have, you know, using more modern equipment and so forth. And we were there, and uh, we did have some meetings of the Upper Manhattan Committee for Equal Rights. Yes. Right? And uh, the, the board, of which I was a member, uh, decided that it was just getting to be overwhelming, this whole uh, situation with the uh, uh, lack of change in the South, that they really wanted to take a step back. And it wasn't just the South, the North too, because we were involved with the public schools, Yeah, you and I. So it wasn't just us, because there were several other people in the building who were active with the group, yeah. but they decided by majority vote uh, not to allow the meetings there anymore. Yeah. So at that point, um, I heard about another apartment and we <laughs> moved. Yeah. 
We abandoned the struggle. That would have been about <laughs> when that, they, that you made that move. That was 61. We moved into the co-op. It was... Um, that would be about 64 or 5. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. about 64, I think, before we went to Sweden. Yeah. 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 Did you, in these years in New York, did you ever um, uh, have occasion to hear Malcolm X? Oh, I used to go to hear yeah. him all the time. Did you? Yeah. 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 And I, I met him on the sidewalk once. I went. <laughs> <laughs> with, um, who was that? With Who wrote Philip. Poverty in America? Uh, yeah. Yeah, he was on the board of... Well, anyway, it'll come to me, you know. Michael Har Harrington, Harrington, yeah. He, I was talking with Michael Harrington and Malcolm X, and we got into a three-way conversation. Mm. <laughs> what do you remember about um, the occasions of, of going to hear yeah. Malcolm X speak? Did yeah. you? You never went. I didn't, no. No, I, I went was three, uh, three or four times. And I guess <laughs> after he had broke and you saw the violence kind of heightening, uh, I didn't go. I guess we went for a walk that morning. He got shot. Oh. Yeah, we were. We lived not far away. Yeah, we but we weren't there. We never. We never way. went to them when they took on religious like. Well, uh, when I don't remember your. You're going. I went with uh, what? What? Uh, Glenda's husband was. Oh. Oh. Okay. Yeah. All right. You knew. You knew we went. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. I went to three or four. Of them. Yeah. His speeches in Harlem. I don't know just where they were, but it looked like some of them were in the Harlem uh, Army building. The yeah. Armory. Yeah. yeah. In the Armory. Armory. Yes. Yeah. And then, yeah. Did you, um, obviously you would, you would take up activism or roles as activists in relation to the war, and I'm wondering, say, by, we, we've, we were just alluding to Malcolm X's assassination in, what, February 65, I guess, um, yeah. and of course by 68 the war is really heated up, Bobby Kennedy and Dr. King are killed that summer, and, um, I'm just wondering kind of how you were taking stock of the, the struggle, if you will, by the late 60s and from, from the perspective of where you were in your lives. Well, we, that's when I first went to Columbia, didn't I? No. We, I went to Columbia. And were you out in well, Newark when the Newark Rebellion happened? And yeah, we were in Sweden. Ah, uh, you were, that's in right. Sweden. That's right. Yeah. Um, no, this is, this is, we I only stayed at Ortho two years. Yeah, but you went to New Jersey College of Medicine and Dentistry after the Newark riots, rebellion. After you came back from Sweden. Yeah. 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 I'm but, interested. I'm sorry. But I don't. You didn't go straight there, did you? No. No, you went to Ortho Pharmaceutical. Yeah. I was yeah. There they for built two him years. a lab, and oh boy, but he didn't want to stay there. Was Ortho a part of Johnson & Johnson? Yeah. 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 It's a part of Johnson & Johnson. And I want to ask about Sweden, but please tell me about why, what, what, what factors led you not to want to stay at Johnson & Johnson? Uh, let me see. Well, I guess, let me see. Uh, was Johnson it and Johnson. Testing products, some of that? Yeah, I was testing. No, not you. When they tested in other, in poor communities in the world, they tested some of their products. I, I just vaguely uh, remember I, I, this. I saw a lot of things that I didn't like, but you know, they used to buy blood here, buy blood there, yeah. and some blood. I, I, you knew that they bought blood all over the place, but sometimes they didn't buy it with Johnson & Johnson's name. They bought it through another front group. Oh. 
and you had all of that going on there. And when you compared their salaries with some of the other places, we weren't paid very much. Huh. So when I got the job in New Jersey, and they paid more than Ortho did. Oh. Everybody was happy I had left because they got a big salary. Yeah. But they <laughs> offered you free tuition for your daughter. Yeah. And other, uh, they gave him a big raise, and he said, "No, I told you I'm not coming back, and I—that's what I mean." So that was Emmett. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd love to hear you. Um, okay, let's pause for a minute here. Okay, we're back after break. Um, just while we were off there for a minute, there's an interesting aspect of the recruitment at the New Jersey College of Medicine and Dentistry, I guess. Yeah. And the their effort to reach out to you because, yeah. as I understand, the the college had, notwithstanding that it was in Newark, which had yeah. recently yeah. experienced this tremendous mm -hmm. uh, yeah. upheaval, um, had few African Americans on their entire faculty. That's right. Yeah. 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 yeah, they wanted you and they wanted you to serve on the admissions department. All of these things that didn't help you very much with your research work. I guess that was one of the things that kind of eat at you. It used to be the doctors were on, the, black doctors were on this, but they could easily get out. I got an emergency, I have a surgery today, and who they're gonna call? Me. So I was covering for probably 10, five or six different people. Yeah. They never showed up. Yeah. They call me. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, I'd love to have you describe your year in Sweden. Oh, could you do a better <laughs> job? <laughs> oh well, for the family, it was really uh, pretty exciting. I'd yeah, say. Yeah, I thought so too. Um, we we went across the ocean in a, a ocean liner to norway and then <coughs> visited uh, a friend from rockefeller institute. institute and his wife who had been emmett's uh, technician yeah. and from there in trondheim we went by uh, train. train down to Uppsala, and we were you know everything just went so nicely and we, we had to wait a while to get an apartment was, huh we had to wait a while. Yes, we had to wait, but that was all right. Well, but the nice thing was going down, we stopped off in Aura. Yeah. And um, we didn't read the, cha the, the schedule correctly, and there was no place to spend the night, and the station master took us into his house. Yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> so that was very nice. Anyway, um, we found it uh, uh, quite a... Um, a welcoming environment. And you worked with Dr. Arna Tisalis? Tisalis? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I really didn't work with him. He didn't come <laughs> Not very often. <laughs> to the lab that it often. It was his lab. But I talked with him a lot. And he had had other professors from Columbia, a Dr. Cabot, and they were great friends. So I guess I got all of those recommendations. And so I got in very easy. Let's pause for just a sec here. We're on. Okay. Um, Priscilla, I, I, I want to ask about, um, you had mentioned during the break that, um, that the Dr. King's speech um, at Riverside Church really mm -hmm. sort of, you know, drew your attention to, to him in a kind of new wider sense, I think, as the 60s were moving on. Can you share that? Well, he, he really blended all these issues. I mean, there was the racial issues, civil rights, there was the economic. Uh, we did go to the people's, uh, well, that was after his death, but uh, we went to the poor people's uh, march as yeah, well, yeah. And, uh, and the war. And what was it? Uh, Muhammad Ali said, "No nigger ever, no Vietnamese ever called me nigger." And I think, uh, you know, that 
this was just that war was um, on so many levels wrong. I mean, it was it was wrong for us to move in to take over for the French after Dien Bien Phu, and it was wrong for the poverty draft. It was not. It was even though it was uh, everybody draft. The other people who could get out of it did get out of it, and <clears throat> and the economic impact on this country, just as same as we're seeing right now. So we have a poverty draft now, and we have this country shortchanging uh, the needs of its own people. So Dr. King, I mean, listening to that speech this spring, I heard it again on the radio, which really made me happy. It was on our Albany station, NPR. Um, it just, you know, really was so deep, and so he's been called a philosopher, what is he, a, an activist philosopher, uh, Dr. King, and most philosophers are not thought of as activists, but he certainly was. Some people would maybe not call him a philosopher, but I would. And I also had great respect for Malcolm X. and. Um, we just recently went to the memorial of the author of the new book about him. And, it's Manning uh, Marable. I, Manning Marable, yes. He was, he's a family friend, not particularly close to us, but other members of the family. And <coughs> so, you know, this, any, and it, I know that in his speech, grassroots speech, you know, he ridiculed the march on Washington and so on. I could understand that. I could understand where he was coming from. It didn't make him my enemy uh, for, for that. And uh, I think he brought a lot of understanding uh, to the, you know, the people who are really disenfranchised in this country. So the combination of these two great leaders, uh, we don't have that today. but. What we really are missing is a mass movement that created them, rather than that we need leaders, we need the mass movement, and we're not having it. Yeah. Try as I may, I'm trying to get those seniors. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get those in. So much so that I know, so much so to both of you, that you have, have in recent years been honored yet again for your ongoing commitments. And contributions in, in, in these ways. Um, let me ask, too, about the, about the long experience now, the lovely long experience of 60, or I don't know your anniversary date, but maybe 61 years of May. 61. Yeah. It'll be 60, this is, it'll be 61, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. It'll be the uh, 62nd anniversary. It was 50, that's 50 years to 2010. Yeah. So it's 62 60. this fall. Yeah. 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 Which is just remarkable. I'm, I'm, uh, you have forged this partnership in a, as, a, as a, a, quote, interracial couple since we have this concept of race that has defined our yeah, reality right. for so long. Um, and I, I would invite your reflections on that experience, too. I, I know Priscilla, you had mentioned during the break that that was something that you wanted to touch on. Well, I did, uh, um, I do remember what uh, Do Dr. Du Bois said, um, and I, it probably was after the love, Loving decision, Loving versus Virginia, the, uh, that overturned all the miscegenation laws in the country. I think there were 17 states that still had miscegenation laws. And um, he was a leader in the NAACP, and he, uh, he made the statement that the NAACP did not um, support, it did not oppose interracial marriage, and it did not support interracial marriage. It believed that individuals who fall in love should have the right to pursue their relationships. And 
that's the way I felt about it. I mean, we didn't uh, fall in love and get married and have three children in order to uh, uh, create some new <laughs> <laughs> racial grouping in this country. Um, some people talk about uh, the elimination of race by uh, consolidation or, no, come on. Um, we have to respect culture, cultural differences and so on. Our older daughter once told us that she thought the reason that we had such a long marriage um, was because of our moral compass and that it we came from very different backgrounds and so on, but somehow or other we had the same goals. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? That sounds very reasonable. Sure. Well, very you good. might have come in for a little uh, criticism of, but well, of course uh, your family, as we have studied more about his family, there has been quite a lot of interracial relationship, yeah. um, including the Alamo. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know quite <laughs> figure that one out, but. Mm. Well, I, uh, he is listed as one of, well, Barclay Paul and that is true. Yeah, well, okay, yeah. Mm. Um, one of Paul and Letty's son, but. I don't know much about Paula Letty, who was my great-great-grandmother's mother. Mm. I don't know where she came from, but I was told that she came from a very wealthy family of the Traverses mm. around mm. Richmond. Mm. So I hate to put her into the Richmond mess. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Bassett, mm. I want to ask a final question of you. I, I'd be interested to hear about your service on the on the Human Rights Commission in, in New York City? Well, I mean, we didn't, we met about every month, I think it was every month, but not too often. And what I would do is to check up and see, see we had several neighborhood groups in our uh, community, which were well organized, like Rena, they had group housing group, and that was the group down in the in house going east. Four twenty one, was that right? Four twenty one. Yeah, they had gotten some in with some group. I don't remember the name. They were trying to get something done about housing in the neighborhood. So I used to look at see how those cases were proceeding. Mm. That was my main interest in going to these meetings. Because we always had big dinners. I have uh, cards where we, we used to meet at, what's the big hotel? Plaza. That I plaza. Mean, you know. We used to meet there. So the, I think the governor gave us a lot of money to run that yeah. organization. Because I never paid for it. But I, I mean, I think this vagueness is an indication of the effect, effectiveness. Let's pause for just a sec. Yeah, that's fine. We're on. Okay. Um, Priscilla, I, I, I want to ask about, um, you had mentioned during the break that, um, that Dr. King's speech um, at Riverside Church really mm -hmm. sort of, you know, drew your attention to, to him in a kind of new wider sense, I think, as the 60s were moving on. Can you share that? Well, he, he really blended all these issues. I mean, there was the racial issues, civil rights, there was the economic. Uh, we did go to the people's, uh, well, that was after his death, but uh, we went to the Poor People's uh, March as yeah, well, yeah. And, uh, and the war. And what was it? Uh, Muhammad Ali said, "No nigger ever, no Vietnamese ever called me nigger." And I think, uh, you know, that this was just that war was um, on so many levels wrong. I mean, it was it was wrong for us to move in to take over for the French. 
after Jen Bin Fu, and it was wrong for the poverty draft. It was not, it was, even though it was a uh, everybody draft, the other people who could get out of it did get out of it, and, <clears throat> and the economic impact on this country, just as same as we're seeing right now. So we have a poverty draft now, and we have this country shortchanging uh, the needs of its own people. So Dr. King, I mean, listening to that speech this spring, I heard it again on the radio, which really made me happy. It was on our Albany station, NPR. Um, it just, you know, really was so deep. And so he's been called a philosopher, what is he, a, an activist philosopher, uh, Dr. King. And most philosophers are not thought of as activists, but he certainly was. Some people would maybe not call him a philosopher, but I would. And I also had great respect for Malcolm X. And um, we just recently went to the memorial of the author of the new book about him. And, Manning uh, Marable. I, Manning Marable, yes. He was, he's a family friend, not particularly close to us, but other members of the family. And <coughs> so, you know, this, uh, any, and it, I know, uh, in his speech, grassroots speech, you know, he ridiculed the march on Washington and so on. I could understand that. I could understand where he was coming from. It didn't make him my enemy uh, for, for that. And uh, I think he brought a lot of understanding uh, to the, you know, the people who are really disenfranchised in this country. So the combination of these two great leaders uh, we don't have that today, but what we really are missing is a mass movement that created them rather than that we need leaders. We need the mass movement, and we're not having it. Yeah. Try as I may, I'm trying to get those seniors. Yes, you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get those in. So much so that I know, so much so to both of you that you have, have been recently has been honored yet again for your ongoing commitments and contributions in, in, in these ways. Um, let me ask, too, about the, about the long experience now, the lovely long experience of 60, or I don't know your anniversary date, but maybe 61 years of marriage. 60, 61. Yeah. It'll be 60. This is, it'll be 61, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. It'll be the uh, 62nd anniversary. It was 50, that's 50 years to 2010. Yeah. So it's 62 60. this fall. Yeah. 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 Which is just remarkable. I'm, I'm, uh, you have forged this partnership in a, as, a, as a, a, quote, interracial couple since we have this concept of race that has defined our yeah, reality right. for so long. Um, and I, I would invite your reflections on that experience, too. I, I know, Priscilla, you had mentioned during the break that that was something that you wanted to touch on. Well, I did. Uh, um, I do remember what uh, Do Dr. Du Bois said, um, and I, it probably was after the love, Loving decision, Loving versus Virginia, the, uh, that overturned all the miscegenation laws in the country. I think there were 17 states that still had miscegenation laws. And um, he was a leader in the NAACP, and he, uh, he made the statement that the NAACP did not um, support, it did not oppose interracial marriage, and it did not support interracial marriage. It believed that individuals who fall in love should have the right to pursue their relationships. And that's the way I felt about it. I mean, we didn't uh, fall in love and get married and have three children in order to uh, uh, create some new <laughs> racial <laughs> grouping in this country. Um, 
some people talk about uh, the elimination of race by uh, consolidation or, no, come on. Um, we have to respect culture, cultural differences and so on. Our older daughter once told us that she thought the reason that we had such a long marriage um, was because of our moral compass and that it, we came from very different backgrounds and so on, but somehow or other we had the same goals. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? That sounds very reasonable. Sure. Well, very you might good. have come in for a little uh, criticism of, but well, of course your family, as we have studied more about his family, there has been uh, quite a lot of interracial relationship. Yeah. Um, including the Alamo. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know quite <laughs> figure that one out, but. Mm. But I, uh, he is listed as one of, well, Barclay Paul and Ed is sure. Yeah, well, okay, yeah. Mm. Uh, one of Paul and Letty's son, but I don't know much about Paul and Letty, who was my great-great-grandmother's mother. Mm. I don't know where she came from, but I was told that she came from a very wealthy family of the Travises mm. around mm. Richmond. Mm. So mm. I hate to put her into the Richmond map. <laughs> <laughs> well, Do Dr. Bassett, anyway. I want to ask a final question of you. I, I'd be interested to hear about your service on the, on the Human Rights Commission in, in New York City. Well, I mean, we didn't, we met about every month. I think it was every month, but not too often. And what I would do is to check up and see. See, we had several neighborhood groups in our uh, community, which were well organized, like Rena. They had group, housing group, and there was the group down in the in-house going east, 421, was that right? 421. Yeah, they had gotten some in with some group. I don't remember the name. They were trying to get something done about housing in the neighborhood. So I used to look at, see how those cases were proceeding. Mm. That was my main interest in going to these meetings. Because we always had big dinners. I have uh, cards where we, we used to meet at, what's the big hotel? Plaza. That I plaza. Know. You know. We used to meet there. So the, I think the governor gave us a lot of money to run that yeah. organization because I never paid for it. But I, I mean, I think this vagueness is an indication of the effect, effectiveness. Let's pause for just a sec. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, we're back. Um, Dr. Bassett, I think you wanted to, to kind of sum up your perspective on the, on the on the merits or, or impacts or lack thereof of the Human Rights Commission? Uh, <coughs> I'm trying to wonder, I'm thinking about where should I start on this, <laughs> the Human Rights Commission. Well, I mean, the one I'm working with now, no. you know, the county is broke jobs, they go to the people who have the inside uh, information and you know somebody to refer them to the proper, to the job. Now in New York City, uh, I guess it's the political climate that will get you a job sometimes, not always, but sometimes. So those are the things that I see and that can be very difficult to get ahead there. Now, I never had those problems because I was never looking for a city job, and I was uh, always able to get a job if I wanted a job. 
but uh, I did go to these uh, uh, dairy technology big places, and there they were not willing to hire you, give you a job, although their plants were right in the middle of the black community, and not even a porter or a floor sweeper or anybody. That black. That was Beatrice Food Company. And 1950. They, no. No. 55. 55. 56. 55 or 56. Yeah. And also, one of my professors had a brother that worked there. He thought I should have told them what color I was before I came. I said, well, they didn't ask, so why should I volunteer? They would see me when I came, and that's what I I got. You know, he talked as if he could soften the way for you. His brother, since he had a brother that had a job, and they both had gone to Purdue, and his father was head of the Dura Technology Department at Purdue College in Indiana. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether Jim. But when I left uh, Ohio State, uh, they got rid of their technology. They got rid of food technology and made it into some, what do they call it now? Food technology. Food, no, the food. Sciences, food sciences. Food, food sciences. sciences. Yeah. Food sciences. They all were put into food sciences. So they got rid of Goo, who was head of dairy technology, and Deathridge, that was biochemistry. It was also combined it with health sciences. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. the three things were combined. I know you've I know you've written or um, elsewhere noted that um, you were much motivated by uh, Frederick Douglass's observation that um, without struggle there is no progress, and you. You have paved long paths of, of, of a great deal of, of social justice struggle on many fronts. So um, I'm glad we've had this occasion to visit and document at least a, a little bit of that work in, in the little bit of time we could be together because there's such a long record of service. So yeah. it's, um, I'm, it's a real honor and a privilege to be with you both. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. We're, we're honored to have participated in yeah. this discussion. It makes me a little introspective. <laughs> I have to uh, look back and see where I didn't do what I should have done. Yeah, I don't know yeah. if it's bad. Eh? I'm not sure it's bad <laughs> at all. Any final thoughts? Mm. Yeah, I remember when I first went to register to vote. That was just before I went in the Army. Yeah. <coughs> I went to a little filling station about two miles from home, and that's where they registered voters. <laughs> so I told them who I was, and he went, I, I thought he was going to give me an application to fill out. That was my assumption. But he just gave me an empty sheet of paper. He said, go ahead and register yourself there. So <laughs> my father was dead by then because he always voted. He probably would have told me what to do. But I talked with another man a week or so before I went up there. And he had told me, his name was Jim Mullins. He was a pretty well-off black there in the community and had run into a lot of problems. He ran the corn mill. And everybody went to that black, white, or everybody went there to grind their corn and make corn meal. And he told me, he says, just think about an application that you are filling out that you want to identify yourself to somebody and put on there when you were born. And I think he might have told me to put on there my race. But somehow, that's one thing I left off. I don't know whether that just never came to me. I told him when I was born, who my mother was, who my father was, what, where they lived, where they were born. I told him all of those things. So he called me back, but he says, you never put on there, you're black. I says, did I need to put that there? You can see I am. And he says, 
just sign it there and get you belong you I, I guess at that time they put Negro I think so that was 40. I, I guess that must have been about 42 or 3 yeah. so I did put Negro down there I think and they registered you yeah registered no problem and that's I guess a lot of people can hardly fill out an application. A lot of people who haven't been to college or finished high school at least wouldn't know how to do that. Yeah. But I did all of that. Yeah. And where I went to school, all of that. Put it down. <laughs> he just looked at it and said, this is fine, except you didn't put your right. <laughs> Thank you both so very much. It's been a real yeah. privilege. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.